Live here. Live! But we don't have to necessarily know what that means. What's the someday of Black? I don't know that we want This story happens now. Ladies and gentlemen, the movie writes itself. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Uh, well. I'm still streaming. How do I stop streaming? No! Hello. Hello. Good morning. Friday, November 11th at 11 a.m. Here we are today. And um, it's going to be a fun day today. On it is. Ben and Jake write a movie. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I realized that actually Ben and Jake write a movie um, is um, a good <laughs> I'm getting a text right now, sorry, from Derek saying, where's the link? And I'm like, I, I sent it to you. Yeah, it, um, actually didn't, it actually didn't come through on that text. Oh, that's yeah. weird. It is weird. That is very weird. Um, there you go, just came <laughs> so, through. This is what a live... This is what, yeah, 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 yeah. a live stream entails. So in just a moment, we're going to have a great interview with our friend, producing partner, fellow screenwriter... Amazing, prolific guy, um, Derek Kolstad, who is uh, the writer and creator of the John Wick franchise. Um, he is the writer of Nobody, uh, which was a fantastic film if you haven't seen it. Yeah. Um, he is. He's got um, Splinter Cell for Netflix, animated Splinter, Splinter, Splinter Cell. Netflix, Netflix, yeah. and, yeah. and like a plethora of other things. But here's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about things other places don't talk about. We're talking about process because that's what Ben and Jake write a movie is all about. <laughs> so without further ado welcome to our live stream derek colstad there yes. he is the <laughs> man the legend i was gonna say yeah. tired and unshaven it's all good. absolutely yeah. hey this out of is bed. a casual podcast okay out of bed and dressed <laughs> i don't know it feels that way the pillow in front of me just going hmm. dude i got my <laughs> cup of coffee i didn't shave this morning it's all good. It's all good. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry. So, thank you so much for coming on and being with us this morning. Thank you, man. Um, not sure how much you know about what we've been doing with this podcast, but um, basically, Jake and I are, are being crazy and we're writing a spec live on this thing. Um, so, we do. <laughs> Look at the face. He was like, right? I was going to say, that's not a smart move, but ha ha good job. Well, good job. Either, <laughs> too, either, either. It's going to be an amazing script, or we are going to crash and burn like nobody's business, and totally. that'll be entertaining too. Um. <laughs> we just felt that it would be interesting to, I think, especially emerging screenwriters who are like, "What does it look like? Am I am I doing it right? How do other people do it? What is right? All those things." And so the other week we had a great, we did our kind of first kind of bit kind of off the cuff interview with our friend yeah. Dave Matalon, who's got a movie coming out on. Um, Amazon. Uh, Amazon next yeah. year, Blumhouse movie. But we thought we also know you. Yeah. And <laughs> and really the purpose of this, I mean, the reason we invited people into our process um, is because we felt like no other podcasts really talk about like the actual process of writing, not like the technical rules or like, or oh, even the like business. what should a slug line yeah, look yeah, like yeah, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But like, what is it to come up with an idea and turn it into a screenplay. And so that's what we've been doing. And that's what we want to talk to yeah, you about. Because apparently you also write screenplays. Apparently. <laughs> yes. And now produce prolific. And now produce stuff. Yes. You're muted. Something happened to your microphone. Oh yes. You got, you, you muted yourself somehow. There's a button. I'm sure there's a button. There's there a is. Button. You know what? I might be able to unmute. I, I un, can I unmute you? Nope, I can't unmute you. Wow. Down at the bottom of your screen in your little square there, there's a little thing with a microphone. Click that guy. Or alternatively, you could just answer our questions with the power of interpretive dance. <laughs> <laughs> we are having technical difficulties. This, again, this is live. Derek this has is happening live. He has and now he's live. gone. My intro scared him to death. He was death. just like, I don't want to do this. I want to speak to you. Because... These guys tricked me into coming. I yeah, they said it was going to be a nice, warm environment. And now they're just. Yes. Yeah. Something yeah. Something has happened, but we are back. All right, here he is. Here he is. There, there he is. Go. There we go. I don't know how these died and then everyone, everything yeah, else. Yeah, that's, and that, else. that'll do it. That'll uh, do it. I mean, like, yeah. I've been wanting to do this since I was really young. 
you know, I, I, I read a shit ton when I was a kid and uh, I love movies. And uh, as a child of the 80s, I wasn't into TV that much because outside of the stuff that you caught in syndication, like Wild Wild West and, you know, um, and, and whatnot, I preferred film. And what was fun is at the time, late at night, we didn't have cable, but TBS would show uncut um, movies from the 60s and 70s uh, late. And so you'd, you'd go down to the basement or whatever and, and see your mom and dad's movies or your grandpa's movies, which was, which was a ton of fun. And um, ultimately I was a consumer first. And, and at a certain point you're like, I want to do that. Right. Yeah. And then you write that first screenplay when you're 13 and you give it to mom and mom is brutal in her notes. Right. My mom was the same way. Yeah. Like, ah, oh, wow. oh. but you're encouraging still. And then you go to, later in life and you see her notes and you're like oh man i must be pretty right. pretty loved with me there yeah, be like did uh, mom used to be a studio executive because these are really yeah. good right <laughs> uh, when you know you know everyone's process is, is different you know and yeah that's the other thing too is we've all read books and, and we've we've gone to various symposiums and gone down the rabbit hole of what is the best way and to be honest there isn't one that's you know and that's the thing right we all have our own process and that's yeah. kind of the fun of i think what we're trying to do with this podcast is just go everybody has their own process and maybe you'll take something from ours and go i like that maybe they'll take something from yours my first question for you is and we've been asked the same thing over the podcast is how do you come up with an idea do you have a specific way do you have do you do you Take Where do your ideas come from? Do, well, you know, Jake and I will actually take entire days and just go, let's just throw shit against the wall and maybe we'll find a good idea. And it's, then it's, some, it's, you know. it's no different than that, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'd say for me, um, you know, in the digital age, it's hard to get away from noise. And so a lot of times it's turn off the phone, go for long walks, and just start thinking about the stories I love and my, you know, looking around the world you inhabit going what you know because when i was a little kid i thought that every gun store a la commando had a secret button that had like a a, a war chest behind the wall right? yeah, yeah. and so to me it's always the world build there i think yeah. when it comes to lead characters it's always some someone who leans into to empathy mm -hmm. and that i would argue that the world may call a certain character an anti-hero but you write him as a hero because he's right. your hero you know yeah. Do you start um, with a character, do you think, most of the time? You no. Know, this one I, I did this week, it was with the idea of a, a, a job that we all know in the real world and shifting as to what it might look like in the underworld, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was fun. And, yeah. and, but a lot of, and then the character that came into it was an actor I had been talking with, and I was like, I think this is for them, you know? And then you kind of you get there, and then you kind of think, okay, you don't want to repeat yourself, but it's still in the genre mold. So you really have about a dozen to 15 characters to choose from. Which one are you gonna do? And honestly, it's an infinite number of characters when you start you know, taking elements of each and kind of like snowballing. But that's where they came, that, came, that one came from. Um, but also like, you know, when you think of even back to, to the first John Wick, we were babysitting, we're not babysitting, we were dog sitting my neighbor's new puppy. And the puppy was a half corgi, half uh, chihuahua. It was a chorgi, which is a miniature corgi, black, uh, tricolor, black, brown, white. Right. And, and a uh, bunch of Russian guys came in and shot the dog. And you were like, this is the start of a movie. Right. Yeah. And I went after them and, and got murdered right away. You know? Oh, my gosh. Uh, but I, like I said, I always have a pillow on my lap. And the puppy was laying on the pillow. And ironically, the puppy's name in, is in the original script. Uh, it's Moose, M-U-S, oh. which I think Dutch means little. And so it's like Moose Little. And that's, that's where I was like, uh, what would happen if someone murdered my dog? <laughs> that's where that came from. That's yeah. awesome. Isn't that oh. funny that it's this nugget? What if? It's a question. It's you a question. Start with a question, doesn't it? Yeah. What if there was a guy like this? Yeah. What if there was a, uh, what if this happened on a plane? What if, I mean, it's usually that question, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's like, like, you know, again, yeah. you guys have known me for a long time, but like I grew up watching everything, but I loved that, uh, you know, 
Cloak and Dagger was a great movie and we all loved it as, as a kid because what if your imaginary fr friend was based on the relationship you wish you had with your dad? You know, it was mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, it's, it, you know how a movie is awesome and then at a certain age and then you watch it later in life, you're like, oh, I missed all of that, so like what this movie was really about, you know? Sure. Yeah. And I think that that's the magic is what we came from. But when you look at that, it's either... Because action scenes are action scenes. I, I, I've never, I've never be, began a, a, a script with that. Um, we all have kind of our back pocket, back pocket ideas that we'd like to throw in somewhere. But usually, it's uh, the the look, the feel, appeal of a world. It's a character. Uh, it's a situation, or it's doing your take on a fill in the blank. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. totally, totally. That well, that's then... a lot of times, yeah. When you've got some of those things starting to kind of foment in your mind, um, what's the next step for you? Like, what does that look like? At what point do you express that on a page? In what form does that take? Does it not? Is it just still verbal? What's the, what's the, as for me, point? if, if I'm going to stack something, um, I, in that, I, I just immediately go to the script, you know, I type in the fade in and I work, a hundred percent in the script on that spec. That's just the way I do it. And do you know like where you're going or are you just letting the story drive it for you? No, there's a reason like, like when, you know, first drafts, no one reads outside of Sonia. Uh, <laughs> and so and that, life, everyone. So. The hardest part too is like a genre, like I love genre, man. And genre usually has a short first act or a very long first act. Mm. Um, mm. I want to say that, you know, usually a very short first act is kind of like a horror movie, you know, when you mm, think of it. Or Ken, anyway. Um, but, or you have something like Man on Fire we all love. I think that first act is like an hour ten. It's so you know, long. long. <laughs> it's really long. long. You know, and it's, and it's the best part of the movie. Yeah. So, so when I spec, I just go there. Um, but I do a lot of um, uh, pitching um, uh, in regards to IP or I've got an idea. Um, or when, uh, when you, when you're working with an actor, especially, you don't want to go to a script right away because mm. then, um, they don't quite know, or the tone of voice or, or that character. Mm -hmm. right. So what I do is I go direct to scriptment, well, no treatment and treatment to me is, um, usually a 12 to uh, 30 page document, depending on how into the minutia you are mm -hmm. and how important it may be to you or the reader. Um, I would say half half to two thirds of that document is the first act because, you know, I, I sold Canyon to Alcon and that's with Davis and Stein. And there's a section in the middle of the second act where it's like, look, we know what happens here. You know, it's, it's these things that I'm going to do this kind of action sequence and that kind of stuff. I'm not saying I, I'm not going to gloss it over, but it's like, this is the stuff you don't have to pitch. We, we get that, you know, gotcha. and then it's like, now let's go to the third act. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of doing it in such a way, mm -hmm. um, especially for an actor to then go like, I see the roadmap. Let's go to right. the draft. Right. Um, but it's, it's also like, even talking with you guys about certain projects, it's, do you, do you spec from the pay from uh, in, in final draft? Do you go to the treatment or do you work on the, on the, on the pitch? Yeah. Now, what I would say is you guys are great pitchers, but I no, script suck. <laughs> I can't believe you've gone this far, man. <laughs> Body, mom and dad, I don't know. Um, but no, I think to me, uh, I can pitch, but it's not my strongest point. I don't really like doing it. It exhausts me. But what I'm good at is going, hey, uh, here's, the, here's the treatment. Or if it's television, here's the pilot. And here's a page on episode two. And here's where I think the season's going. And here's right. where the show could go. Mm -hmm. Now, can I go write it? Now, I will also say I have the earned luxury of I've got some stuff that got made and did okay. Yeah. You know? yeah. When I go in, they're coming into that from the standpoint, the filter of, oh, he did, he did stuff. People trusted him and it paid off. You know, so I, I know I'm in a different yeah. place. Sure. But I, I still think that... Um, the grand irony is we're writers here and we're expected to do the little, uh, the little dance, right? Yeah. In the pitch. And we've all known people who are awful in pitches because they're just, they're nervous. Uh, I, dude, honestly, the first time I did it for the first year, I had the whole script up in front of me. 
not on a screen. We weren't zooming then, but uh, we do. We bring our iPads in. Yeah, I had to. It's just, but now, like they're like, in 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 we we it's like the maybe it's the ten thousand hour rule. Now, if you sat me down and just said, "Pitch me a take on this," cool, let's riff because you're just Mm. on your own skin, and that's the game. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Let's say you've got this idea. You think it's really cool. It is going to be a spec screenplay uh, because that's what we're doing here. And, you know, our process is we tend to do a really deep outline. I think that really has to do a lot with the fact that we're in a partnership. And so it, it helps us get on the same page. If you're diving into that first draft and you're just going fade in, bah, um, is there any point during that first draft where you go, oh, fuck, I didn't think about that and like have to go back and then like change everything on like page five from, you know, or do you just go, I'm just going to get to the end and then hand it off to Sonia and then see what happens? Well, you know, I think every story is different, but honestly, I like simple stories. Those are the ones I watch. Mm-hmm. Even the ones that people are, con- are are convinced are complex, like the usual suspects of the world, he right. lied. That's the reveal. That's the right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or even uh, going back in, back in time and watching Total Recall as a kid and, and negotiating or just debating, was it in his head or did it really happen? And then you're an adult, you see the movie, you're like, it's all in his fucking head. Like, I mean, it's right there, you know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I, think, I think for me... Um, the best movies are kind of like the old NES video games, right? Mm-hmm. You're going, you're going from one boss level to the next and pausing to buy something from a weird wizard somewhere, you know, to, to, to enhance your sword or what have you. Mm-hmm. And once you get all those elements in play, I love having heart and love having humor, but you know, as you guys can attest the you know, especially in the buyer scape, you, t- you send them a script. If it's 88 to 94 pages, they're going to read it. Right. Mm-hmm. If it's 140, I don't care who you are. That they, they know something's wrong, yeah. unless you're like, okay, look, there's a lot of history in there. It's an epic, blah blah blah. No, you know. Um, and I think to me, my first draft tend to be long because of two reasons. I use a lot of ellipses um, because it helps me think, and it gives me mar- like margins in there to uh, for Sonia to write. I use a lot of cut twos and fade twos and POVs and stuff. That's for her and me, and mm-hmm. it's actually for the reps as well. Because if you think of having those gaps, it becomes kind of like this uh, a pacing thing. Mm. Uh, when we get to the final draft, all of, most all of that gets out unless you you really want it. Because I don't want to tell the director what to do. Right. Um, and I, I rarely use like pan and tilt unless yeah. it's yeah. really important, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think I think to me, I like I like getting the first draft out, but I spend most of my time on the first act. Because that's what gives, you know, that's what gives you a But I'll also probably admit, your favorite scenes in any movie tend to take place in the second act. Mm-hmm. And I want to say it's, it's, it's either, a, it's a magical mystery tour as to what works and what doesn't, you know? Mm. Yeah. True. One of the things I think we really learned, we read, we read a draft of John Wick when it was still called Scorn. And we, I think, were inspired by the pacing of your action. In fact, we, you know, adopted it as our own um, in The Princess. You know, we were like, we want this to read as fast paced as possible. And what I think yeah. what what we always like so much about your writing, if you'll let me praise you for a moment, <laughs> is that it just feels like you're watching a movie. Right. I think that's what's so great about it. It's going to go, oh, I'm, and it, and it, but not only in the, in the way that it's described, but actually in your use of, ellipses and white space and it's almost like and i love this it's not a criticism like you don't write in like full sentences like they kind of merge on into the next bit and then he does this and then this happens and then this and you were kind of like you like you had to keep reading this thing and you were in this sequence just like that just like john wick in that moment and had to keep going because it was that <laughs> you know me, that was that's that a lot of that isn't from screenwriting or movies. It was from reading books from like Alistair McLean and Dash yeah. Hammond. And then in the eighties with Tom Clancy, when he would really go into the action and write prose, like, I, I think that's important. And in fact, some of the greatest backhanded, what would you call it, backhanded compliment I've ever I've received is a studio had 
uh, you know, turning a script back in going, that's pretty good to his assistant. And, in, and, and he, he had, had X through all of the action and he had written on the script. I got it. Uh, something like punching and kicking. And his assistant said, dude, read it. And he came back. He's like, Oh, <laughs> you know, like, you know, and, and so I, I think that's the other thing too, is the greatest joy I have is not everything you write in a script makes it to screen, not especially in the action space, but when you see one little thing, even if it's just one in the sequence, you're like, Oh, there it is. Because for the most part, it primes the pump for the second unit. It's it, yeah. all the stunt guys. All, and, and I love those guys. Dude. They feed me as much as I feed them, if not more so. It's the hairpin in the opening scene of The Princess. Yeah. yeah. You know? It's that, oh, yeah, I love that moment. <laughs> um, so how many drafts would you say you do before you give it to, let's say, your reps? Or before well, you, you know... I'll go, you know, since we all know these people, I'll just yes. go by their, their, uh, their positions. But like, yes. uh, first is Sonia and I, until mm -hmm. we get to the place where, you know, um, she's like, yeah. Uh, second is Josh Adler, who's my manager. Right. Thing. Um, right. Once we get yep. him done, I loop in uh, the rest of my APA team, uh, which is Cheryl, Debbie, Kyle, and Lucy. And then um, they luckily all compile and aggregate their notes and by the, but they also know by the time it gets to them, mm -hmm. it's been through two pretty fierce gatekeepers. Oh, yeah. um, and yet each of each of those people bring in uh, that perspective shift. Uh, and again, you don't have to address every note. I mean, yeah. I always like I'm pretty good with grammar. These guys are fucking amazing. So they'll, they'll catch they'll catch things where I'm like this last this last thing was like is it embedded or embedded I am or em and I'm like oh it's yeah, em no there was a yes. difference <laughs> I just <laughs> like, no idea, you know I was just typing you know that word you know um, but then the other thing too is you for lack of a better turn of phrase when you turn in a script you kind of want to have a couple of hanging chads in there. Not as like, um, not not as traps, but right. as as places to go. Like, look, there is a divergent path in this scene or these characters and this action and this heartbeat that I'm going to leave in there as divergent, so that when you're talking to producer, studio, buyer, we know that's what we're talking about, and we can come to which if we go left or right together. Um, I, I, you know, how do you do that? Though? I mean, that's. Yeah. I, like I, I, that's really interesting, but I can't. Well, like in in this last draft, uh, there was this notion of what happens if an innocent is killed, and it's this it's a sci fi movie, and it it was an awesome question, and I never really gave it much thought because I, I didn't think it was happening. But then you kind of looked at it as like, do you remember that Fast and Furious where they stole this the safe? Yeah, and dragging it down. Actually, the my favorite one. Yeah, you yeah. Know, and you're like I think thousands of people died. I, I, everyone getting coffee is gone. I mean, they're, 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 yeah, it's that, that's a phrase, right? Uh, it's one of those things that, like, I'm not going to, I, you know, I, and, and, and I always talk to the person giving the note going, dude, good note. I'm not going to address it, but I, I've written it down so that if it comes up, that's something we can, we can chat about. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it's the kind of thing that you want um, a director, an actor, or someone else to, to kind of uh, to, to lean into because their answer, I think, is going to be better than mine. You know, I'm so far into the woods sometimes, I'm not seeing the trees. Mm, totally. So it's almost like purposefully having a beat where you know it could it could bring a note, but that you want someone to give a note because it bring it like makes them more invested or it makes yeah. it, it, it also it like, them I don't know the answer. Yeah, I have some right. options. And yet, look, I, I, I don't think that uh, we talk about this a lot, but the, I don't think a, a script is biblical or canonical, especially yeah. when you're trying to get cool shit made with cool people. You got to right. be malleable, you gotta be flexible. Right. There's something mm -hmm. in there that can be flexible, and to said marketplace, to said talent pool, to said just yeah. getting paid. Um, right. I don't want to go too too far as it's my way or the highway. All right. you know? totally. Also, the other thing you could do is at the end of each scene, you go, if you want John Wick to kill the man, turn to page 54. If you want him to uh, kiss the man, uh, turn to page 73. <laughs> <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> Dude, I've seen, by the what was the, uh, uh, was it Bandersnatch? What was yeah. that? We were just yeah. talking about Dude, it. I've seen, I've seen that script. Like, uh -huh. 
man, those guys are geniuses are insane. I know, right? It's one wow. or the other. It's one or the other. Right. Uh, I guess my question for you is, and of course, you know, uh, after all that stuff is done and you get notes, what's your approach to notes? You know, the first thing is just making sure that you're getting all the notes at once, that there's yep. an education occurring. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times, um, if that doesn't happen, you're going to get, you know, two different notes on one topic, mm-hmm. or one section, and you're going to think to yourself, okay, who am I listening to? Mm-hmm. And sometimes you don't want to listen to the better idea because the more powerful person has the lesser idea, right? Right. <laughs> but that hasn't happened in a long time because we're, we're I just we I just try to get everyone on the same page together, and a lot of that is through Adler and team at APA. I'm going, let's get it all in one place and let's, let's, let's have a clear roadmap moving forward. Right. Um, right. I would say that outside of um, going through all the various gatekeepers um, there had, you know, in the past, you know, five, six years, I haven't really faced like a, well, uh, let's blow it all up. Uh, actually a couple of projects, but <laughs> I, I mean, well, myself in the ass there but i'm saying most of them uh by the time we get there it's like yeah i see it all you know okay and well come on, you guys have faced i'm sure but if i have a scene that i like but i don't quite think is working in the screenplay but i'm like eh, maybe it'll pass it never passes so right but she knows she's like look i like this too but it's the pacing the tones off it's it to just just have them do this or just remove the scene and right. get it home, you know She's a good editor in that way. You've got yeah. that person. But what if, all right, I know you're saying it's not, it doesn't happen often, but have you ever been on that Zoom now or in that notes meeting where the most important person in the room gives you a note and you're like, that's terrible. And um, that's going to ruin everything. You know, I think it's always you take a breath when you hear something like that. Mm-hmm. And just let them keep going. You don't want to interject with positive or negative because I would argue a hundred percent of the time, it's not what's first said in the note. It's what comes after it where you realize, Oh, that's, what's important to them. You know? Mm -hmm. Um, So we're human. We lead, we lead initially with how we address that thing they want. And if you just let them talk and listen through, you realize why they want that thing. And then you're like, Oh, there's the why let's focus on the why. Mm -hmm. And ultimately by focusing on the why their idea might not seem so bad because now you understand the why and you can actually tilt it that three percent do it. Shift. But a lot of times, like I'm not going to be that guy on any zoom saying, well, that's fucking terrible or that's <laughs> genius. You just need to talk it through and, you know, uh, right. and, and just kind of see why, why they said that in the first place. Yeah. And once you understand why you're like, cool, that's something we can work with. I think it's really interesting because the phrase you hear a lot is what's the note behind the note. But I actually prefer the way you phrase it, which is why, Mm. why, why do you, why do you want that moment to happen there? Oh, well, because I think we need an emotional moment or whatever it is. And I I like what you're saying about, I I like what you're saying about the follow-up of the why Jake, which is um, that not only is it, Oh, the why but if you know the why then actually most of the time you can figure out how they got to their idea and try and make that idea work for them because you understand what they're trying to do with the idea that's a really interesting way to approach it and there was something that josh our joint manager talked about that i think me and ben really heard recently which is and i've heard you say this on calls and you'll laugh because you'll feel seen which is What I like about that idea is, (laughs) (laughs) but it's so true because you go, I hear you. Mm. There is something in that. I perceive the why maybe it's not the, that version that you're pitching, Mr. Producer, Mr. Executive, even Mr. Actor, maybe Mrs. Wife, you know, but what I like there is this. This It's like when people say that, or is, is this is like, you know, let's look at a, a, at a, at a sequence of events in a screenplay as a pizza, right? Usually that, no, 100% that note is one slice of the pizza, right? Mm-hmm. So like you can say like, ah, fuck the, the whole pizza shit, but like it's one slice. And so right. to me, it's going deeper into why is that note? And ultimately 
if you go to the why to no, 100% you go to the why together, it isn't that that initial idea was bad. It's like that was the knee jerk reaction to that, you know, at its core. Yeah. Totally. I would also say is the two things that when certain questions come up, you either just have a character answer before it's asked, you know, um, it's the classic gremlins of it all, where it's like, you know, uh, hey, they hate sunlight. Uh, don't get them wet and uh, don't feed them after midnight. That if you were uh, a, a, a father of a child getting that that pet, you'd be like, no fucking thank you. That yeah. makes no sense at all. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, just, just something, you know. Right, right. But I think, too, the other one is um, if it isn't working, uh, take it out. Because mm -hmm. as soon as you take it out, um, you will either – if there's no connection tissue, no connective tissue needed, great. And if it is needed, you'll figure it out. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we've all we talked through this even on the princess. Yeah. There were scenes that we were desperately trying to make work that ultimately were like, guys, cut it out together, the three of us. Now let's see what it looks like. And once that little fucker was gone, we're like, oh, thank God. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, and again, yeah. the better idea came into the the vacuum created. It is right. doesn't always work that way, but a lot of times, if you're in this together, the classic, you know, I say all the time, Iron Shirt Desire, best idea wins. It comes into fray, man. Mm. Yeah. 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 No, that's, that's totally cool. I'm going to ask you one last question because I know we told you it would only be 30 minutes. So um, I'm not going to hold you to anything longer. But something that someone asked us recently was, what do you do when you don't know what you don't know where to go? You, whether you call it writer's block or whether you call it like, I'm, I'm just stuck in a place. And when do you know like when to put the script down or when to keep pushing through? How long do you keep trudging through that endless swamp? You know, I, I think it's funny because I think when you become like where you, where we are as professional writers, this is paying the bills. Fucking cool. Is that right? Yeah, right. Um, that happens to us in the rewrite that happens to us in the polish because it's like taking a class that you hated in high school. You mm -hmm. just don't, in the goddamn file because you just don't have it in you that that to me is the hardest thing and that's the thing i'm still trying to figure out how to do you know ultimately you just have to put a gun to your own head and say do the work right just do the work now i think from inception phase um the first thing you have to realize is it's not a failure on your part if you wrote 20 40 60 pages in and didn't know where to go you wrote fucking 20 40 and 60 pages in yeah, every page you and i write we get better at what we do so don't think that that was a failure in your part that you couldn't tell that story because by doing the pages, you sharpened um, your sword to get on to the next thing. And that might be the one that gets out. Um, I've never gone back to any of the orphans I've got. I, I always call like, I, I call the, the screenplays that I finish orphans. I call um, the, the, you know how you, you've got a scene in a movie that a screenplay that you love, but uh, you're like, it's not working. So you cut it and you put it in the, uh, well, I've always put it at the bottom of the file. I've never gone back to them. I've got thousands of those orphans somewhere and way too many files, right? But you, like, I would never look at it as failure. You got to that page. Just because you didn't finish that doesn't mean you didn't fuck up. You started it, you got there, you recognize that you don't want to go. And then what you do is you sit down and you write fade in and you try it again. And again, like, to me, I know a lot of writers who don't like writing. Uh, and I think ultimately that is not the gate you get to the point of attrition where it does get tough, you know, mm -hmm. but ultimately even here, the joy is that blank page where no one's harping in your ear. No one's looking over your shoulder. You're all alone. You're listening to music or I just listened to a, a, a what do you call it? An air purifier in the corner that just gives me this drum. Some white noise. White yeah. noise. And you're alone and you're with your best friend in your head saying let's go here so mm. I, I think i think i've answered that but like I, I never want anyone to think that that's a failure yeah right. i really i re i really like that i really respond to that and i've never thought about it that way mm -hmm. i've always thought about it as i was trying to do this thing and i yeah. and i got stuck and yeah. i failed rather than and i am a and i say this a lot that there is value in everything and i've never really fully seen up until this moment, the value in giving up on a screenplay or giving up on a project other than, you know what you were doing with this? You were sharpening a sword. 
Well, and on top of it, too, when you think of it, too, when you look at those screenplays, right, you get to page 40. You have a plot. you got a character, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary, and you get a world. Um, ultimately, there's something in there that if you love an element of it or think that there's something there, you rip it out. Mm-hmm. You surgically remove it and go play with it elsewhere. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I've never read the old, uh, you know, initial uh, drafts of Star Wars, but I'm under the impression, like, seeing some of the um, artwork, you're like, yeah. who's that dude? Yeah. Right? That's right. Luke Starkiller. I don't know who that yes. is. Yes. Like, yes. What was yeah. it? Like, like, I, yeah, like I, I can't remember. Again, you might know it better, but like Han Solo and Chewbacca were like, at one of the drafts were one character or like that right. kind of thing. Mm. And they were like, oh, let's make it two. Like, that's, I think, what happened is he saw something there, but recognized it as, you know, would make it better is this. I mean, right. even like the, the Coen brothers, I can't remember what movie it was, but they they were writing a movie. And then I think it was Miller's Crossing and they had writer's blocks. So they wrote Barton Fink, which was about writer's block. And then huh. went back to Miller's Crossing, something like that. Yeah, sure. Uh, and by the way, that, uh, I mean, it's still a genius movie that I don't have any idea what it's about. But, it's, <laughs> but I, I think too, is again, the takeaway from that question is every page you write mm-hmm. is a success, man. I yeah, like that. I, hear I like that. that a lot. Yeah, we've definitely have had moments where we haven't finished. You know, we've gotten sixty, sometimes even seventy pages in, and we just don't know how to. We can't get yeah, through. Get the, the we're going. It's it's not working. We don't know exactly why it's not working. There's an ending that we thought was going to work, but it doesn't work anymore. And after like you know hitting our heads against the wall for hours, we just go, we got to put it down. Right. And and it's hard to not look at that as a failure. Um, But I love that you're absolutely right. Not only is that sharpening the sword, but then the, all of those ideas now live in your brain. Yeah. And without even necessarily reading them again, they come out like the good ones stay. The bad ones just kind of like go away, but the good ones that you did come up with in those pages, they sit there and yeah. then they might come out through even subconsciously in, yeah. in future work. But that's also part of the reason that even when we work on The Princess or a couple of the other things we're working on now, moving forward, mm-hmm. you find yourself copying scenes from bad movies, but it was a great scene. Yeah. You know, you know, and it, <laughs> or, it's, or, it's, or it's a weird, like, it's just like, you know, kind of like the scene in there. Right. You know, like, Ooh, yeah, you know? And that to me is elementary. And it's just the, mm. uh, where we can geek out on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Awesome. Well, we should let you go because you, we know you've got writing to do. Dude, on all of the 943 projects that you currently have in development. I know, really. Nice. Uh, you know, I'm just going to start. I'm going to take my own advice and just stop writing all of them and start over. <laughs> start over. <laughs> start all the way. Start Dude, over. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. Nothing thanks left. so much, Derek. It was awesome. awesome. And um, yeah, thanks for being on. And we'll. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking very soon. Yeah. Actually, give me a shot, buddy. We will. We will. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Bye, Derek. Thank you. Bye, bye. He's such a dude. I love he Derek. Is. I love Derek. Cole He's just Spire. you know, and I always, I always, you know. I remember the story. I was in a, we were at New York Comic Con and uh, I was coming back in a cab with Josh, our manager. And John Wick was just about to come out. It was like 2015. It was just about to come out. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about how, you know, Derek had written on, he'd gotten credit for a movie, but I don't think it was amazingly successful. And he was like almost done. Right. Josh said, just give me one more script. Just give me one more, just one more. And if this one doesn't go, then no harm, no foul. Each guy separate ways. Right. And that was, and that script was John Wick. Yeah. yeah. And John Wick has become, we were just discussing yesterday, this absolute phenomenon. Not only did the trailer for John Wick chapter four just drop, but mm-hmm. also the ballerina is filming, mm-hmm. which is the spin-off of it. Yep. There is the continental TV show. Yep. There are video games. There are Funko dolls. It's become this thing. It, re- it revitalized it's Keanu Reeves' career. It's part you know? of pop culture now. It's part of pop which culture. Which is amazing culture. because not all movies, even yeah. successful ones, break Completely through. Right. It's yep. funny. We were talking about Avatar and how, yeah. you know, I'm excited to see the new Avatar. Yeah. But something Avatar did not do was break through the pop culture barrier. That's right. And become this kind of thing that 
yeah, people were talking about it while it was out. But yes. after it was out, when it left the theaters, it no didn't, it didn't impact it. culture. Yeah, it doesn't mean it wasn't a great movie. It just it means it great. didn't impact culture in the way. John that some Wick, is. yeah, absolutely has impacted pop culture. Yeah, yeah, it is fully like part of move the. Like when someone looks back at the movies of like the 2010s and yeah. Yeah, 2020s, John Wick, the John Wick franchise will be part of that conversation. Completely. You know? Yeah. Um, it's Absolutely. great. And I can't wait to see all the other stuff he's doing. I love Splinter Cell as a game. So I yeah, I'm super excited about Splinter Cell. Um, and That's Nobody is, uh, I love, if you haven't seen Nobody, it's Go so, check out fun. Nobody. It's so yeah. fun. Go see Nobody. Anyway, we've got, um, we're really, we're really fortunate to have st have done the princess with him. He was he was a great partner on the princess. You, everyone yeah. who just watched that can see how just cool and chill he is. Yeah, and that's the and way then, he is all of the time. Yeah, that's the way he is with producers. That's the way he's with. He's just such yeah. a dude. He's great. definitely not us. No, <laughs> definitely not. Totally like not us. We're just a pair of fucking arseholes. We're just fucking crazy. Um, <laughs> but. Yeah, I hope you liked. I hope everyone liked that interview. I think. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to try and continue regularly having interviews. We still have, um, you know, a lot of wonderful people that we know that we, we do. I would love to know how they view things. You know what I found the most interesting about that conversation, in the context of what we're doing in this podcast, his process is totally different than ours. Yeah, and I love that. I do too. You no, know? it just, I mean, it just, yeah, and that's it. Is that. There is no one way to write a screenplay. He gets an idea, he has an idea, and he just starts putting it down. If if he's specking it, just starts yeah. putting it down. Yeah, you know? and like like just literally writing fade in. And and I got to be honest, like I've tried that. Um, we collectively have tried that. Yeah, and um, it's hard. Um, it's hard yeah. to not have broken to not even know where it ends. Yeah, and you just go. I know I want to write this story. Mm. I don't have the answers yet, but I'm just going to and get into this. It, yeah, I find it to be interesting. And I think what I find to be a challenge, why mm. I would find that to be really scary, is because I feel like screenplays are different than, say, novels, for example. Yeah. I, I, I've been talking a little bit this week about Stephen King's on writing, which I've been listening to a lot lately. And... He literally just goes, oh, I've got this concept, I've got this idea, and I'm just going to sit with the characters in the world and the interesting scenario that I've created, and I'm going to let that kind of come through me onto the page. Right. And I kind of feel like it's okay when you're writing a book because you haven't got 110 pages to do it in. Yeah. You know, you can go, you know, if this book's going to be 160,000 pages long, that's what it's meant to be. And I think it's different for that yeah. kind of narrative form. With screenplays, I feel like you have to know where you're going. And maybe Derek does know where he's going. Maybe he's like, here's a concept. I know how it's going to end. And I'll figure out how we get there, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. I also think it was interesting that he's like, he doesn't, he, like his first draft so long. Like what yeah. you're saying, it's like he knows they're long. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. You know, first drafts can be long. Right. Um, and then also something that was interesting to me um is that he gets notes from his agents, which is not something we've ever been good at. No. Um and partly I don't I don't you know, there's different kinds of agents. Uh, I think some agents like to give notes and some yes. agents aren't really notes givers. Yeah, perhaps they're sometimes they're good at it and perhaps sometimes... Our first agent yeah. had no interest in giving notes. No. Um, but it was interesting. You know, I think the the benefit probably of going, hey, I'm not going anywhere with this script until the people I trust with my career yeah. give me their feedback first. Yeah. Totally. And that the complete removal of ego to going... You do understand certain things that I don't. You yeah. do contribute things that I don't. You know yeah, things. For sure. And I want to hear them. And like you said, I don't have to take all of them. Right. I can go, you know what? I'm going to put that on the table. I'm mm -hmm. not going to address it right now, but it's a great thing to think about. Yeah. And yeah. that's really wise. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be frustrating when you've spent so long writing a script. 
we've gotten notes from i mean we get notes from josh as well we we do usually we do. send him the script first yeah we do yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or if you're working on it with a producer and we're getting notes for the producer um which might be a little bit different i don't know the agents will weigh in quite as much if you've got a big producer that's already weighing in everyone wants to kind of defer to what the producer is going to do mm. but um but we've kind of always resisted <laughs> wanting agent notes yeah we have um, yeah i i, I, I and it's, it's interesting is that I, w I would be intrigued to know if any of our agents at any point would have and could have feedback i mean it's been interesting we've only really taken out like the amount of specs that we that we have taken out well i mean we've shown, shown them we've shown things. them a few drafts of yep. certain things yep we got a little bit of feedback on one of them. Yes, we did. We got a little bit of feedback way later on the same one that we didn't actually know was there, but we found out later on. Yeah, sure. Um, and then the other one we got no feedback on. Yeah. And it wasn't that we didn't say, it wasn't that we said we don't want feedback. Although right. I think at one point you might have actually said, we, we only want a little bit of feedback. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you might have actually said that. Yeah. But but I'm really looking for feedback right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that might have been what you said. We're, we're really happy with this, and we're not looking for feedback. We just want you to read it. Um, that was a really dumb thing to say. Yeah, but and, and it was, but it's all learning. And I think that's, you know, I think that hearing, I think that's one of the benefits of having these interviews, hearing yeah. that that's what he does. I go, yeah. And of course, he is gosh. immensely successful. So I want, I mean, I love Derek. I, I and I would love to have his career, you know. Um, yeah, and he is an inspiration to me. Yeah, he has um, been an inspiration to me too. And yes. so when I hear like, you know, I don't know that I'll ever start a, a script without even outlining Act One, Act Two, Act Three, and where my midpoint mm -hmm. is, and, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, having sure. a broad idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, okay, God bless. Um, but the other things I go, yeah, yeah, actually, that's cool. Yeah. I, 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 that, that could work. You the know, really good takeaway for me as well. I mentioned it in the interview was, um, just the way that you view those things that you didn't finish we, and that you didn't do. They're not failures. No, they're not failures. We really talked was, about that a lot recently. Yeah, that's absolutely. Um, it was interesting. We, we came back to, uh, a conversation about a character yesterday, a historical mm. character mm -hmm. that we had talked about 11 or 12 years ago that I'd begun to do a little bit of work on a, on a screen and then completely dropped and let go and gone, wow, just, that's just, I mean, literally sat in an obscure folder in my computer that right. we were suddenly talking about yesterday and I go, and I suddenly got like, here's all the research I did about this yeah. thing. And we were talking about, not that we're jumping into that right now, but right. that there was, you know, again, you might start something, start something like that's not, that's not. Prepared. Never wasted time. There's never wasted time. Never wasted time writing. There can be wasted time on social media. There can be. <laughs> um, hopefully you're not wasting your time watching us right now, but there is never wasted time writing. Totally. I mean, even if it's just a little bit of sharpening that sort, I like yeah. the way he phrased that. Yeah. So that being said, um, Let's see if we can do a little bit. I think this, a little bit. this session will probably go um, a little long today. And um, I think that's okay. We'll cut out the, the interview portion. Yeah, we'll do a separate, so that a separate people video can, that. Um, can, can just watch that if they want. And for anyone who wants to stick around right now and watch us sharpen our sword, um, let's do it. Let's do so it. So what, um, what do we, how do we leave off yesterday? I'm trying to remember exactly. We were in Act Two. We actually wrote some of that first. We thing. did. We worked. We we um, worked through some of that. Some of that. Kind I'm of having expositional so, aspect. As I was lying awake last night, as I so frequently do, um, I was having a question mm -hmm. about um, the emotional truth mm -hmm. of Hank's acceptance to work with this demon so easily so quickly and i just wanted to just talk it through even if we come to the same place sure. i just want to talk through the emotional logic of that okay great um so let's I, just I, talk yeah i think that you're right 
he can't come to it too easily. And I think that it'll be important for us to show that he's not okay with yeah. that. And that in fact, I think what could be cool is that Charlize and Hank are both a bit on edge around each other. Right, right. right. It's an uneasy truce mm-hmm. that they yes. need to agree to for now. And he yeah, says, I think that's really important. I, I really am important. not going to say I'm not going to kill you, right. but I'm not going to do it now. And yeah. then over the course of the journey, that he actually realizes that she's a good demon, whatever that might be. Whatever and that might be. And she yeah. actually realizes that and understands why he would do what he does and 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 is not doesn't yeah. think of him in the way that she might. Yeah. Um, but I but suppose I agree, then, yeah. be the I should kill you. I should kill you too. But they're worse, and she needs to be taken care of. So are we going to do this together? Are we like maybe there's even a moment of are we going to do this? Yeah, or and are we going to fight it out? And there's a speed because obviously this this scene is happening fast. Sure. You know, um, so I just wanted to make sure that because of the external pressures of Zod and his crew, and then the police showing mm-hmm. up, that in that moment. And again, I'm just I'm just talking things through. Yeah. And I'll, so just go just back to it. Okay, so Hank has turned up, mm-hmm. and remind me, he ties he's up there the boy first. Or he's, she's there first. He's there first. He's she, the back. He's, so he has arrived. Yes, he's knocked out the boyfriend. Whatever. He's got Sam on the yeah. ground. He's in the middle of almost killing her. He's about to, he has He's found that for this her person life. is this, you know, uh, the thing that he was focus taught. of demonic energy. Mm-hmm. It's, I found her, thank goodness. I've, she I'm going to kill has the mark. I know the mark is what she's I'm looking for. She's got the mark. Yes. Then in bursts a demon. I'm almost expecting this. Of course, because the demons would want her. Because the demons and would I want her. I think that Charlize is actually Zod. In, Absolutely in right. Of, you know. Absolutely right. She comes in. They have a brief fight, brief moment of something. And then Charlize is like, I'm going to kill her. And that's the big moment, isn't it? That's the big moment of, wait, you're going to do what? Right. And she's like, I'm not one of them anymore. I'm actually trying to stop this from happening. And he's like, well, that's what I'm trying to do. Right. That's weird. Before that can get fully resolved, Zod and the crew turn up. Yeah. Yeah. I think that yeah. moment that you're talking about, the, <laughs> wait a minute, you and I are both here for the same reason. I think that moment needs to be expanded out just to understand this, uh, like, her, Charlize, with urgency, can say, there's no question that the other demons are coming. So yeah. either we're going to kill her right now or we're not, but we need yeah. to make a decision. Yeah. And Hank going, I there's something, like, Hank cannot trust her. I yes. Like, why do you want to kill her? Maybe the teachings are wrong. Are you actually trying okay. to make her the answer? And, and like, you know, demons are wily. And so confusion. This is what right. they do. This is right. a part of what you do. And I think that this conversation, this face-off, I mean, like, think about for a moment. I've got a gun to your head. You've got a gun to my head. Right. We could kill each other right now, or we could help each other. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. When Zod comes in, it's a, yes. are we going to do this yes. or aren't we? Because we have to decide right now. Right. And in the middle of all this, there's a 21-year-old girl, human being. Yeah, who's been knocked out and on the floor. Who's been knocked out on the floor. But the simplest version of it for both of them is bang. Yes. But that's not what they're going to do. Right. Now, Hank might be, then fine. Let's stop pointing the gun at each other and point it at her. And right. Charlie says, wait. Right. There's stop. something about her. I just went to, she's not turned yet. Yeah, not yet. We need not to talk. Yet. And he's like, she's like, I'm just gonna show you this really quickly. I'm gonna go down on the ground and I'm gonna show you the mark isn't done. 
Something right. like that. There is a reason that Hank's like, oh, fuck. And I think that, you know, we have a similar beat that we just wrote. I know we do. Yes, the, I know. When they get there. But I think that's okay because it's about the fact that she is turning more. Right. And so while she show, I think what that actually does for us is show that there is time. Yes. That when she first shows Hank the, the symbol is like, and we've looked at the symbol and it's got like multiple aspects and markings of it, right? Yeah. When she first shows Hank, it's not fully formed. It's not fully yeah. dark. Yeah. And then when they open up the trunk and it is more formed, but still not complete. Yes. And there, I think, is a moment here. And it's what we were talking about a, a couple of sessions ago about Sarah Connor in Terminator 2 for a brief period of time becoming a Terminator. Mm. and that that's something that she's like oh fuck I, I was almost this kind of person and mm. I think Charlie says it here she's like yes we could put you could put a bullet in her head right now but she's not this being of ultimate darkness yet mm. she's a young girl who just lost her family mm. if you put a bullet in this innocent girl's head right now you're mm. no better than the people you've been trying to stop this whole time and I think that should hit Hank in that moment, even if it's just enough to give him pause. Yeah, because I don't think she he should believe her yet. I agree. But, but it's just enough to make him not pull the trigger. Wait, like, if you are right in the 1% chance that you're not yes. trying to fool me, yes. then I would have killed an innocent person and that's not who I am. Absolutely right, yes. And so I was just getting into wanting it's that. that. It's that scene. It's that push and pull. It's yeah. after we've knocked Sam out, yeah. And before Zod arrives, yeah. we have what ultimately becomes an un uneasy truce. That then yes. continues into the we get to the, the used car lot. Yes. And at that point they go, and it I think it expands out that scene. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna try and reverse this. Yes. Do you want to help me or not? Yeah. And him going, I there's no way I can work with a demon. And her right. saying, well, we both have every reason to kill each other, but can we at least wait until we save the world? Yes. You know? Sure. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, totally. we can get back to our right. argument right. later, yeah. but at least for now, let's yeah. save the world. Okay? Right. And I think just through talking it out right now, that's what we just need in that. And that's just what I was looking for. It's not like I'm kind of like, a, oh, okay, I'll come with you then. You pop her in the car and it's going to totally. be okay. Yeah. Well, let's yeah, add yeah. that into the outline. Right. I'm pull right. it out. Right. Um, and just um, just throw those ideas in there because that way, you know... Um, that way it's written down and we won't forget it tomorrow. Which happens <laughs> all the time. Um, so basically just going back yes. here to Charlize um, and Hank, uh, it's going to be the door's kicked open, Charlize, Hank fires at her, da-da-da-da-da. Yes. So... He, when does he, when does... In the standoff, we down? get the fun banter of why are you here? No, why are you here? They both came to kill her, which doesn't... They both came to kill her. For Hank, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. She's a demon. You're trying to trick me. Right. Um, I know what you're up to. Yeah, you're tricking me. Something, some, some. Yeah, something totally. Like um, is this a trick? Um, yeah. And then it's basically um, she shows the mark. The mark isn't complete. That's right. There's still hope. If right. if you kill this girl right now, you'll be just as bad as you'll be. You'll base. You'll be just like. A demon. Yes. Before he it the yeah the question gives her gives him pause, and in that pause, Zod and the gang show up, and they have to decide. This is a mo. There has to be a moment. Yes. Are we work? Are are we? You yes. Know, and or and out? Charlize can prove her allegiance. Prove what side she's on she's fighting by Zod. fighting Zod. Yes. Which I makes agree. Hank go, okay, maybe what you're saying is true. Enemy, I'll deal with the consequences. Enemy of my enemy. Yep. 
think we wrote that somewhere else as well. For now. Yeah. yeah, for now. Um, and then in the in the parking lot, it's gonna be we can either essentially before yeah. this, when they're fighting over like I should kill you right now, we can yeah. put that away. Yeah. Um while they're in the car here, right? Exposition, stakes of Sam, uh Antichrist in the trunk. Hank should kill Charlize. Right. Um, it would make this vice, all easy. And vice versa. Charlize totally. Kill him. And ultimately, that's it, isn't it? It's like there would be a really easy end to this, but it would be morally ambiguous. And Hank might hurt him, might hate himself for the rest of his life if he killed Sam. In well, this I mean, no, I'm not talking about Sam in the car. I'm, I'm talking Charlize. about Charlize in Watch the car. Yep. And that it's the idea of, yes, we're on opposite sides. Right. You're a Nazi and I'm a, an American. But for this particular moment, we're going to work together because actually... It's the SS just, or worse. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is. It's that yeah. It's that um, That book you talked about. That's when they right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Castle, you know? it's, yeah. That, it's that thing of, you know, you know, but the world is at stake. Totally. And it's like, as you can see, I'm fighting against them. You want to go up against them on your own? <laughs> Can we put aside our differences yeah, right. until we until we save it? Yes. Then we can fight. Yes. Because <laughs> they've already fought also. And and we know that they're relatively equally matched because Hank yeah. has the gear and Charlie totally. the demon. So it's like, look, we can finish what we started later, but let's just put that off. Yeah, right totally. Here. Totally, totally. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Great. Um, that, 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 that really helps us like, just combat that feeling I was just having just about making sure that moment, because it's a great moment. It's a really great moment. And ultimately, it's in this version of the log line that we talk about, which is demon hunter and a demon team up to save the life of the anti yeah. But it's, a, <laughs> it's an uneasy alignment. Yeah. And that, that's difficult. You know, it's, it's like a demon and a demon there. hunter make an uneasy truce. Yeah. In order to... St- you know, to save the Antichrist. Yeah, totally. Um, which I think, you know, is 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 still really cool. Yes, I do. Um, yeah, cool. Great. And the next thing that we talked about, we had just started to talk, and I know we're we're over our hour right now, but we had just started to talk yesterday about where they go next. And one of the things that I had pitched was, yeah. do they go back to Charlize's bookstore? And I think that's nice. Um, I think that's nice. I think it helps out budgetarily as well. It's a location yeah. we can use again. She's got... And then does like- not attack them then at the bookstore? Or is it good? I don't want to have repetitive sex. I know, and that's it. Is you, you don't know? have repetitive And what's movies. interesting about movies like The Terminator is, yes, The Terminator is always coming for them. Yes, it's a gunfight. And yet, because of the locations... And because of the way it's crafted, they never feel repetitive. No, they don't. I mean, go- going to Terminator 2 for a second, let's just look at let's just look at it. You know, the first one is um Yeah, Terminator 2, even more so, doesn't feel repetitive. That's right. So T 1000 is looking for John Connor, locates John Connor in the mall. Mm-hmm. Arnie shows up, protects him, they flee through the LA River. They go. Mm-hmm. Awesome chase, awesome sequence, super fun. Amazing. They then decide what they're going to do. John says, We have to go and get my mom. Right. And Arnie says, No, that's the first place he'll go. And he says, I don't and care. He says, I don't care. Yeah. I order you to go and do this thing. So he goes, Okay. They go and break out mom from, and what's so kind of coincidental we've talked that, through the plot of this movie yeah like, yeah times. is that yeah um, but that, there's but, this whole sequence there yeah then then the other part is we then go and do this like yeah there are there are these the is each set piece each set piece has a different, different intention it's different not just the running. no but although they all end with and now we're back on the run and now we're back on the run yes we start with we have a goal and they end with now we're running. Now in the right. first Terminator, it's we're running the whole time. There yes, is no it's different. It's but different. because of where the set pieces take place, yeah, 
they also feel different. He's not just going to get them in, uh, you know, another chase. He's attacking a police station. Sure. You know, sure. Um, you know, he, there's the. So I guess the kind of where my questions go are, if we're going back to Charlize's bookstore, what becomes the obstacle either when we're there or mm. on our way to there? Does it have to be Zod and the Demons? Sounds like a great name for a punk band. Or is it the police, for example? I know we've had the police in this previous sequence, so maybe mm. that's not right. And how do or how is that obstacle activated en route to or at the next location oh, yeah. that we're going to, the next place that we're going to. How much do you think we have space in this to create the police as a real true obstacle? Because I'm there is not a version. sure we do. Well, uh, no. the reason I ask is because at the moment, I mean, like, if you think about term the first Terminator, you end up with scenes, you cut away from the main story, and although the main story is playing out in the background, where you're actually just with the cops. Mm. Um, True. you know, especially towards the beginning of their involvement, yes. yes. Um, and if we wanted the cops to be their own obstacle, um, I feel like you need a character specifically that is the way into them, mm -hmm. and I and I'm not, I it could be interesting to do that. I mean, for example, they if this is a kidnapping. Mm. Uh, then it's not just the police, perhaps. It's a, it's the FBI. Totally. And they have an I FBI mean, agent coming in. For and sure. then they're following them across state lines. Yeah. And they're tracking them. And... I mean, it would be, I mean, here's the thing, isn't it? Is you go, Charlie's arrived in her car while they're not in her car when they flee. The cops saw her get they out her car on CCTV it. and they go, where's it registered? It's registered right there. Exactly. There's a very now, easy way to the next that. set piece that the FBI has got the, her store staked out. Yeah. And when they show up, it's a little confusing because Sam is actually walking with them and yet the like do we cut from here i guess is my point to our new fbi agent in charge of sam's kidnapping maybe maybe we do it's a question i'd like to sit with it because again thinking about midnight run mm -hmm. there are lots of pieces at play in midnight run mm -hmm. there are there are there's there's the mob there is and there are the fbi right. you have this two pronged and then there's another guy coming after him as yeah. well. There's another quote unquote bounty hunter coming after him as well. I, he wants I like that. And I do too. And, and it, it doesn't it fresh. Yeah. And it's not about making it complicated. The through line is still simple, but it's what oh, yeah. are the obstacles in the way? It's creating new obstacles. Yeah. And actually, if the F what's interesting too is if the FBI is fully engaged, yeah. they become an obstacle to Zod as well. Oh, totally. And then you've got two bad then they can go out and the fbi isn't bad they're actually yeah. trying to help sam yeah. so there's also the the conflict of we don't want to hurt them they're just doing their job they don't understand what's going on yeah but zod has no issue hurting them right we get blamed for what zod potentially yeah that's does. really interesting that's cool but, Great. you know like something really cool about yeah. making the obstacle while you're you're right. The through line of the plot is the same. The obstacles become really complicated. Yes. Totally. And we still know what we're trying to do. And now yeah. there are just more people trying to stop us. I think that's interesting. Yeah. Um, I think we should dive into that next week, though. Cool. Yeah, it is. I forgot it's Friday. Next it is week. Friday. So can we just put here, though? Yes. FBI gets involved. Now, uh, conflicts, obstacles. Mm-hmm. Uh, become more complicated. Yeah. They find her car. Yes. They know where she, you know, yeah. They know Maybe where they're from. interviewing her boyfriend who she That's lives interesting. with. That's interesting. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the red car registration is at his house. Mm -hmm. That's right. 
That's right. And that's that, right. And so we get another scene where we bring him back in. Yeah, completely. But again, completely. I love when when you can create subplots. And that's that's one thing that I feel like some movies are really missing these days. Yeah. Is interesting subplots and characters. The subplot of Charlize's relationship with this with this other guy right. is really interesting. Totally. You know, the and subplot, then it's, of course, it's going to become a big complication for her, which is like I don't what? want him to get killed. And what were you doing? Does you went it, off it, one day, it, had no idea where you went, and then the FBI are saying character. you kidnapped a girl? What if Zod ends up kidnapping boyfriend and, oh, and kid? that's great. Yeah, that's great. That's great. That's and great. they want to do a prisoner exchange. Totally, totally, totally. It's fun. That's I mean, really fun. you know, I'll put a question mark. Zod kidnaps um, boyfriend and kid question mark but but like mm -hmm. i love when there's a really and it, you don't have to have more than one no but right. but even the fbi agent if he becomes like a really like if he's the tommy lee jones from the fugitive totally and i'm super into what he's doing yeah, and i know right. what's great about that is i know that Charlize and hank are trying to do the right thing but right. he he doesn't. doesn't completely right again it's just like the terminator that first one Yes. They don't know that Carl Reese is doing the right thing. Right. They get in the right. way. Yeah, for totally. sure. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, this was really great. Was great. Um, I Thank hope you. everyone enjoyed our interview with uh, with Mr. Kolstad. Um, I think we uh, are, will probably talk about who, uh, who we can have on um, maybe even next week. Let's see. Um, exactly. Try and see if we can do this either a weekly, bi-weekly thing yeah. where we have... Yeah. Um, another screenwriter on to tell them their process. So far, Dave and Derek have totally different processes and we have a different process from them. And yeah. I think that's, um, I think that can be really educational for writers. Absolutely. So. All right, Derek, right. it's not today. That's the end of uh, Ben and Jake write a movie for today. So sure we're is. All right, bye everybody.